change. Uh, we, we know this historically. But if you don't know anything about the history of Islam, a Muslim can come up to you and tell you whatever he wants. Or if a Muslim comes up to you and says, hey, in Islam, we respect women. And you haven't done a study and you don't know that according to Islam, women are intellectually deficient, that most of the inhabitants of hell are going to be women who are ungrateful to their husbands, that a husband can beat his wife if she gets out of line, that in paradise you'll be standing in a corner waiting for men to come and enjoy you. That's, that's, the, that's the future you have to look forward to. You don't know any of that and so, ah, Islam, prom Islam promotes women's rights or Islam is grounded in science. If we don't know the facts, if we don't know the facts, Muslims can say whatever they want to say, and this allows them to win a great number of converts through deception. So part, probably the main goal of this show is to educate people. I am convinced, I am convinced that if the entire world, or if an area, or if the United States, if people learn the facts about Islam, if the facts about Islam become common knowledge, if the facts about Muhammad and the Quran become common knowledge, you won't see anyone convert to Islam. You would, you would see very rare conversions of strange people who are interested in violence or something like that convert. But you would not see uh, 30,000 converts for, per year. I don't think you'd see 1,000 converts per year in the entire United States if people knew the facts about Islam. So yes, we want to educate people. We want people to understand uh, the teachings of Islam. And I'm convinced that this will stop, uh, this will stop the spread of Islam. Uh, she's telling me the other things that are concerned, uh, two other uh, issues here, but they're more political than religious. Okay. Uh, the first one, she said, when Iraqi refugees comes here through Syria, they only give us the Muslim refugees, and they don't allow the Christian Iraqi refugees to come to the country. That's number one. The same story in the American embassy in Cairo, when they know they give visas to Muslims more than Egyptian Christians. I don't know if this is in our control or the government control. Yes, uh, th this 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 is this is a big problem, and I know I know of I know of specific people uh, who can't get to the United States either because their government government is controlling it or because the government here uh, won't allow she them. She says there is Muslim employees in the American embassy in Cairo. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and people mm -hmm. people go people go to Egypt and try to get over here to stop the persecution. Apostates, people leave Islam, they want to get out. Uh, and can't get out. I know uh, one of my, George Sayag, George Sayag, uh, his brother is in Sudan. These are gung-ho Christians, and I don't know if you know what's going on in Sudan. Christians are being slaughtered. His brother has been trying to get out, the country, get out of the country and can't. Uh, but if a Muslim, if a Muslim uh, says, hey, I'm, I'm being persecuted or something like that, or hey, I'm having a problem, uh, the government will, will, will allow them in. And it's, it's not, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, uh, I mean, the government will, will often let them in. Um, now, I don't know if it's because Muslims have people in, uh, in the government who are, who are guarding this. A lot of it has to do with fears of being labeled Islamophobes. Some Muslim says, oh, hey, I want to come to your country, and you say, no, we don't want you. Uh, oh, you're being Islamophobic. Don't you want? Don't you want but more? But this is the wrong really basis of yeah. entering people in or out of yes, the Yes, certainly. If you're, if you're dealing with countries like Sudan uh, or Egypt. We read Egypt, the news every day. Yes. Yeah, if, you, if you're dealing with countries like Sudan or Egypt or uh, Iraq, where Christians are being slaughtered, surely if a Christian <laughs> says, let me out of here, if you believe in human rights, then if you're a Western country, you should, you should say, of course you can come here. Of, mm -hmm. course, we'll, well, of course we'll take you in. Uh, but they're not. They're take, I mean, the West has taken in millions of Muslim, uh, of Muslim mm -hmm. immigrants, and they have taken in a number of, of Christian immigrants. Uh, but certainly a group that is being horribly persecuted and slaughtered should take priority if yes, the interest yes. is in protecting people. All right, people. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our phone is uh, 248. 416-1300. Uh, We're going to take a break and we'll be back with you as soon as possible. Stay with us. Light of men. Defender of widows. Ruler. Holy. All-knowing. My song. Light of the world. Deliverer. Sanctuary. Honest. All powerful. My strong deliverer. Living bread. Dependable. Savior of the world. Hope of Israel. All present. My support. Lord of glory. Dwelling place. Self existent. Horn of salvation.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're still in the, our program, Jesus or Muhammad, and we are talking uh, this afternoon about the spread of Islam, and we uh, talked about the origins of Islam and Muhammad, and uh, uh, we reached Mecca and how he conquered his own people to spread a religion, and we were, some of the callers said that it wasn't uh, by force or by intimidation, but we proved from the Muslim books that it was. Uh, and now we are continuing with the subject, the spirit of Islam. And uh, David, you have something to... Uh... Yes, for our, our Muslim friend Ibrahim, who is talking about how horrible the uh, pagans in Mecca were persecuting the Muslims and uh, tried to get around the fact that Muhammad's persecution of them was much worse. Let me read to you a passage uh, that talks about, this is from Ibn Ishaq, this talks about uh, the treatment of Muhammad towards the Meccans, what he, what he was doing to them to upset them. Remember, Muhammad survives in Mecca for 10 years, uh, condemning their beliefs, condemning their beliefs, and he survives, and he makes it through that. Let me tell you uh, how the, uh, the Meccans, the people of Mecca, tried over and over again to reconcile some way. Uh, they offered Muhammad things, they offered him money, just please look, and they, they, it, it was okay for him, it was okay for him to go around preaching Islam just stop standing outside the Kaaba and condemning our beliefs and condemning our forefathers and insulting our gods. Just stop doing that and we'll be fine. So they tried over and over again to reconcile and to live peacefully with Muhammad and Muhammad refused. So let me read you a passage of what happened. Uh, so Muslims are talking later on and they're talking about what happened in Mecca. I said to him, what was the worst attack you saw by Quraysh upon the messenger of God when they openly showed their enmity to him? So what was the worst? What was the worst thing? What was the worst thing the Quraysh ever did to Muhammad while he was in Mecca? He replied, I was with them when their nobles assembled one day in the Hijr and discussed the messenger of God. They said, we have never seen the like of what we have endured from this man. Now what, 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 did, what was Muhammad doing that upset them? He has derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers, reviled our religion, caused division among us, and insulted our gods. We have endured a great deal from him. While they were saying this, the messenger of God suddenly appeared and walked up and kissed the black stone. Muhammad walks in and kisses the black stone. Then he passed by them while performing the circumambulation, and as he did so, they made some slanderous remarks about him. So they talked about him, even though he had uh, abused their forefathers, insulted their gods, and so on. Uh, they made some slanderous remarks about them. I could see from the messenger of God's face that he had heard them, but he went on. When he passed the second time, they made similar remarks, and I could see from his face that he had heard them. But again, he went on. Then he passed them the third time, and they made similar remarks. But this time he stopped and said, Hear, men of Quraysh. By him in whose hand Muhammad's soul rests, I have brought you slaughter. They were gripped by what he said, and it was as though every man of them had a bird perched on his head. Even those of them who had been urging the severest measures against him previously spoke in concili uh, conciliatory ways to him, uh, using the politest expressions they could think of, and said, Depart in true guidance. By God, you were never ignorant. So shortly after this, the, the, the persecution tends to step up. But notice... Notice, why was there persecution? What did he do? Derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers, reviled our religion, caused division among us, insulted our gods. Then Muhammad comes in and says, I bring you slaughter. I'm going to slaughter you people. And then they get violent later on. Uh, think about this. If, again, if I walk up to the Kaaba today and I deride the traditional values of the Muslims, abuse their forefathers, revile their religion, cause division among them, and insult Allah. And upon all of this, I 